Friday, Monday, um, April 27th, uh, 10 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. And welcome, uh, Grace Star Communities. The, uh, my name is Judy DeWall. I'm the Livestock Coordinator at um, Everly Short Pump. We're a um, building that is still in uh, uh, pre-leasing and being built, um, but it would be some gab. And um, as I was talking with Sally, um, I got to actually gab this morning. Sally is a resident at Overture Miller in Austin. Um, and for uh, she's lived there for just a little over a year. She earned her journalism degree at Auburn University and spent her early career as a newspaper reporter, an entertainment magazine editor, and a business journal feature writer. Later, Sally entered the nonprofit world and spent more than two decades as a communication executive, and most recently, an eight year stint as an executive director of a nonprofit dedicated to planning for the regional growth and quality of life of Central Texas. In 2014, Sally returned to the freelance writing and found many intriguing stories to tell, especially about Texas. Throughout her career, she has won a number of awards for her writing and publication works and has just begun to dabble in fiction. Sally has three children, nine grandchildren, <laughs> three fish, many pet cacti and succulents. And I welcome <laughs> Sally to join me today. Um, and. I've invited Sally to join us because her and the residents of Overture Miller have taken on a project of um, a mass project. And I wanted to share that today with our audience. Um, good morning, Sally, and, good and morning. welcome to Good News and Gap. Thank you. Thank so, you. You're welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about your mass project that is happening at Overture Miller? Sure. Well, Let's, I guess at the beginning of March or mid-March, uh, whenever, uh, whenever that was, when we first, you know, all learned about the virus and, and what that was going to mean for us, everyone was kind of like shocked and surprised. But that soon morphed into what can we as, as a community do to help, um, uh, you know, solve this problem or help those who are trying to solve the problem. Um, and my one of my good friends here, um, Hadisha, was um, uh, she and I were were talking, and and it, it, we were particularly tuned into the medical workers because we both happened to have daughters that were in the medical field, and we became I think it became aware publicly actually that uh, the the uh, protection the personal protection equipment that the doctors and the nurses had in the hospitals and clinics were not gonna be adequate for all the cases of the, the virus that were coming in. So that became an immediate problem. And I noticed uh, that online, in Austin at least, I'm sure probably all over the country, people were starting to mobilize and creating something called mask covers. And the reason they were covers and not just strictly masks were because the actual masks that doctors wear or nurses, whatever uh, technicians wear, are called N95s. And that's what was in short, short supply. But they found okay. that if you created a mask cover that would go over those 95s, then you could use that all day and then take that cloth off, wash it, and reuse those N95s, which was a real godsend. And, I mean, it wasn't... The ideal thing, but in in the absence right. of having enough equipment, you know that was great. So, right. um, Hadisha, my friend, actually also happened to be an extra excellent seamstress. So maybe that's part of why this idea kind of occurred to us. Is she she knew that she could do it, and then there were others who were talking about it, and we all kind of were thinking through this together. We looked online, we saw some patterns um, of how to make them. And um, we just started collecting supplies from the uh, residents because what you need, you need fabric and threads, you know, materials. Right. And um, right. this is what they look like. Um, this is just one. We just used whatever fabric we had handy. They have, okay. they have ties on them. They do not use elastic because when they were sterilize these and the, their sterilizing equipment, it would melt the, the elastic eventually. And so oh. that's why we had to use ties of different kinds rather than um, elastic, which you see on the regular masks. Right. Um, 
And the and that's the other interesting thing is after we started doing this, um, one of the other residents noticed online that one of the other challenges of the workers were now that they were wearing these N95s all day, basically, which they didn't used to do. Right. It, they have elastic and it rubs behind the ear and it became okay. raw behind their ears. And it, it was becoming problematic, especially for certain kind of people with that had a problem with the fit. So a number of people came up with ideas of how to relieve that. And the idea was to create a connector that would take the elastic and put it behind your head and it wouldn't even go behind your ears. And there were okay. people doing 3D printing and there's all different kinds of methods. But one that was very clever was, um, like I said, one of our residents was like a, a crochet queen, if you will. <laughs> and she could do anything with crochet. And so she came, she saw um, uh, a pattern online where you could crochet a strip and oh. then you put buttons on each end. Okay. And then this would go behind your head and attach to the pla the elastic. So we started making those as well. And um, and so we, we got started, basically. You sure did. How many people do you think have been involved in this project? Well, you know, one of the things that happened right away, as soon as we started kind of mobilizing this within the community, and it had to all be pretty much by, a little bit by word of mouth, but we were all starting to be hold up in our apartments, but it was, you know, emails and newsletters and such people wanted to be involved. And mm -hmm. so um, we tried to, we tried to think how could we involve more people than, you know, two or three. And so we kind right. of divided the tasks up into different little segments. For example, there would be, we needed contributions of fabric and other materials. We needed people to take that fabric and cut out the pattern into the masks, then we need someone. Okay. To, we needed someone to sew the masks. Then we needed someone to um, maybe make the connectors, sew the buttons on the connectors, and and there were all different tasks. And, That's great. And and also people, some people who didn't know how to do any of that contributed money. So oh, I no. never really have counted uh, how many people have been involved because what happened was like we'd say oh, we're really in need of ribbon or, or fabric or whatever. And the next day, there'd be a pile of ribbon sitting on the, the lifestyle coordinator's desk. We didn't know who it was from, so I can't even say who it was from. So, But I would guess yeah. anywhere from 40 to 50 people probably have been involved in some way, shape, or form. Um, but like I said, it was really difficult to actually count them. But many people, and some some a small part, some larger part, some every day, like Hadisha, and one other person pretty much sewed all of the, the masks we've, we've created so far. Wow. And, um, but uh, what we really had a lot of cooperation and people really were excited to do something for the community, actually. Great. How are they being distributed? Well, one of the things we decided early on, and, and like I said, we saw online this was happening all over the region in a big way. Thousands of people actually are doing similar kinds of things. But right. for a couple reasons, we wanted to pretty much stay local, as local meaning around our community. And for those who don't know, Miller is somewhat like Stapleton in Denver, where they took an old airport and made it into a walkable, livable community with, you know, everything here. And so we wanted to try to, to affect the people that we actually interacted with. And so there are lots of clinics and various health things just here. There's a Dell Children's Hospital. There's... Um, a dialysis uh, clinic across the street. There's emergency centers. So we actually have given out about 150 so far masks um, and everything from emergency centers, a, a chiropractor down the, on the corner. Um, the, uh, there are uh, several different kinds of clinics around uh, that we have given things to. My most okay. recent um uh, distribution was just last week, something I hadn't really thought about. Um, it's evolving because as people are starting to get more equipment, there's not quite as, as scarce as it once was, but as uh, our community, like probably many, are now asking the public to wear masks. Right. 
And so what we're finding is health clinics in places that are related to that, when people come in there, sometimes don't have masks but should have them on. And so okay. one of the most recent ones I supplied masks to was the Ronald McDonald House, which if you know what that is, is it's, it's sure. just down the street from us, but basically it houses families who have children in the hospital. We have a okay. children's hospital right adjacent to us. And so they were thrilled to get them because families would arrive there sometimes in you know an emergency situation and just quickly, right. and they didn't have anything like that. So we supplied masks for them to give to their families who needed those, especially wow. if they ever were going to be allowed to go into the hospital. But it, it's a variety, right. and we're and now I think we're going to look at we are looking at some of the first responders like the uh, EMS and the fire departments and things like that. Right. And yes. I, but I think it's morphing, it's evolving a little, and like I said, because there's, um, oh, and another one was recently was another kind of medical clinic, and people were coming into the med medical clinic, but they weren't, some of them should have masks, but if either they, they couldn't afford it or whatever, right. and they, we gave them some to supply to their patients. So that, wow. that's sort of evolving a little bit. And the connectors, that's, too. That's to just degree. awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think this meant to the residents of Overture Mueller? Well, you know, in, in the beginning, I mean, the whole point of this was to try to help the helpers, basically, help those who were helping us in any way we could. And we're, you know, we're a small community. I don't know. We maybe have 150, 60 people. And we knew it wasn't going to have a huge impact, but we figured anything we could do was, you know, helpful. And so um, right. I think it all made us feel good that we actually could contribute something that was valuable because, you know, sometimes you just can't think of what you can do to help. But in this case, yes. there really was a real tangible way to improve the lives of those workers on the front line. And so I think everyone felt very good about it. And, and I also think it, in this, you know, hiding away cloistering that we are having to do, I think right. to have, something valuable to do instead of just watching TV and reading books and doing puzzles to have something yeah. tangible to do was, was valuable, I think. And, and I think made people feel good. Everyone wants to feel needed and what Absolutely. a wonderful way to have a purpose um, to get up that morning. Cause you're right. We all are feeling claustrophobic. We're all feeling, you know, when is this going to end? But to, but we all know purpose in life. Um, it gives gives you a reason it's ongoing. to get to know Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I thank you so much for joining me today uh, and telling us about the, the project at Overture Miller. Um, well, I was happy I, to do that. I'm, I'm really I, proud of all the residents. They, they really stepped up and kicked in and, and, um, you know, and Owen, oh, and I want to mention Sandy Long too, was the person who came up with the, the crochet idea and, Hadisha, who's done most of the sewing, and many, many others have been so instrumental that we really appreciated their help. Well, and I think I think you make a good point. It doesn't take; it's not just one. When uh, when you not. take on a project, it's a team. It's it's a community, um, and to give back to your community like that, um, uh, you all must feel so so proud. And uh, and I thank you. Um, I know probably every. Uh, organization that got your masks and connectors thanks you too uh i can only imagine their their gratitude so i appreciate you. you joining me today sally uh, um, i'm delighted to keep up the good work please tell me um stay in touch and let me know uh, the progress how many you're doing and i'll be happy to do updates um but uh, again this is yeah. overture miller um uh, an active um you are an active 55, 55 and over, over. yeah Active 55 and over community in Austin, Texas. And um, I wish I could have um, had everybody that was associated with the project. <laughs> that would have been a challenge. <laughs> so, that might have been. I don't know how many screens I can get. But please send a thank you to uh, your whole team and uh, and tell them thank you. And Absolutely. I think they have our gratitude. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Bye, Sally. Bye-bye. Well, thank you for joining us. That's about all the time we have. Um, I I hope that this story inspired you to um, maybe find a way to give back to your communities. Um, 
it takes just one person with an idea and a lot of people love to run with it and um, we thank Overture Miller, we thank whatever else is going on in the Grey Star communities uh, to help our, our first responders, our frontline workers, and um, you have our gratitude. I will see you next week with more good news stories, maybe another gab, who knows? Um, but uh, have a great week. And from uh, Team Everly Short Pump, we say uh, thanks for joining me today.